So folks, at the end of the day, we know old Donnie has no moral system. He doesn't care about anything. He doesn't give a darn about justice, democracy, peace, human dignity. But he does care about his own success and his own survival. And there are three things you can use to measure that. Money, support, and his legal troubles. And all three today have plummeted at the same time. His level of confidence in his own financial security, his own political support, and his legal security have crashed simultaneously. And I have three amazing clips to play for you which outline this. You might have seen the stuff about the legal issues, but we got brand new details expanding on it. But what we've seen is that one of Trump's biggest supporters his biggest supporters overall, one of the people that helped make him president and legitimize him. A billionaire donor has ditched him at the last second, drying up his fundraising. And at the same time, the issues around his dictator comments have caused his polling to collapse with everybody beyond the MAGA cult. And critically, the legal situation has gotten so much worse. Watch all of this. Again, it's a longer video than usual, but we're covering a lot. But then I'm going to explain to you one thing that no one else has said on this website. I'm the first to bring it to you. And it's only going to make sense when we watch all of this. Watch all of this, and I'm going to explain how these three things together screw him even harder than you might think. Dean, you Neil. Um, what about that? I mean, the talk is that you, you've sort of sized up the, the field and, and you like Nikki Haley and, and, and you want and you want to support her. Yes, I am going to support her. I think uh, she's just what we need right now. I think her approach is smart. I think she's clarified herself in some missions, which is very important. And more importantly, I think the American people need this kind of leadership. Uh, statesmen like elegant. Uh, just think of where we've been in the last six or seven or eight years. It's not good, Neil. It's not good at all. So by that, you, you, you did, you did not, not like good Ron DeSantis. For... I didn't mean to jump on you there, Ken. Why not Ron DeSantis? No, I did like I no no I did like Ron DeSantis. His numbers aren't moving, Neil. Yeah. The handwriting's on the wall. Uh, now, on the other hand, Nikki Haley has had a very substantial upswing. Look, the one thing I am committed to is we've got to beat Joe Biden. If Joe Biden is going to be their nominee, we've got to beat him. We can't take any more of this man. What's going on in the country today is mayhem, absolute mayhem. So uh, the, you, this you, had a chance, with his you son, had a chance also to support the present front runner, Donald Trump. He beats Joe Biden in all these polls, so why not Donald Trump? Look, I think his time has come and gone. Uh, unfortunately, the last three months of his presidency certainly did not speak well of him, not in my mind anyway. Uh, you know, I, I, I admired what Al Gore did in 2000 when, they, when David Boyce said there was still a chance of fighting Bush in court, and Gore said, the American people have had enough, we're done. He put the American people ahead of him. What, what Trump put this country through for the last three months of his presidency was disgraceful. I'm sorry. And I, and I think, frankly, that's, that, to me, ruined his chances to succeed himself at some point. So, uh, you know, I think what happened on January 6th, all he had to say was, please go home. You made known your feelings, now go home. He sat in a room and watched it for three hours, did nothing about it. So that's, America that, is better that, that, than that. And America, deserves, and America deserves better than that, Neil. Understood. So let me ask you, just to be clear for a lot of people who are just tuning in now, Ken Langone has decided to throw his support, financial support and otherwise, behind Nikki Haley. And what was yeah. her reaction when you told her that? She was very grateful. She was very appreciative. She's uh, excited, not only just about my involvement, but the fact that she's beginning to get significant traction. You know, uh, I've been to a few of the Coke events, the Americans for Prosperity. Right. Trust me, these guys know how to raise money, big money. Having, having them in her corner is no small feat. And I think um, the other thing, Neil, she said something the other day. She came in to see me, and I had a small group. Do you know she's flying commercial in her campaign right now? Hmm. I was shocked. I was shocked, and I was pleasantly surprised. Just think of that. She said, I'm saving all the money I can for ads. And by the way, I think...
If she comes in second in Iowa, which is a good chance, in my opinion, I think she'll be, that'll be pretty much the end of the rest of the candidates. That should be over for the rest of them. Unless Ron, DeSantis, she's come from unless nowhere. Ron DeSantis won Iowa. That's his goal, to win Iowa outright. Well, uh, uh, by the way, if he doesn't win Iowa after all he's put into it, yeah. that's my point. If he, by the way, no, Trump will win Iowa. If Ron DeSantis comes in in second, is what you're saying. No, but DeSantis, if she comes in DeSantis in second, I think Ron's got to... DeSantis thinks he, he has a good shot at winning Iowa. Well, let me say this to you. Uh, Ron DeSantis would be a good president, too. Don't misunderstand me. Okay. We just have to have a winner. We need a winner. Bad. America needs a winner. Twenty and his advisors later considered using the Pentagon to seize voting machines following his election loss. And now the Republican frontrunner is threatening to deploy the National Guard to crack down on crime in primary blue states. And also if he takes back the White House, listen. The next time I'm not waiting. One of the things I did was let them run it. And we're going to show how bad a job they do. Well, we did that. We don't have to wait any longer. we got to get crime out of our cities. Joining us now is Tom Nichols, staff writer for The Atlantic. We should note your piece is one of so many. The entire uh, edition of The Atlantic is dedicated to the danger of a future Trump presidency. Tom, help us decipher the rhetoric versus the reality here when it comes specifically to the military. Trump uh, makes a great show of venerating the military in public. He um, talks about, you know, how much he loves the military and talks about his generals when, in fact, um, he actually um, has a deep disrespect for the military, as I point out in the piece. This is a guy who uh, referred to the to America's war dead as losers and suckers um, and uh, doesn't really understand, as John Kelly Four star Marine General, as John Kelly later said, doesn't understand anyone who has served their country honorably. What he does understand is the pomp and the parades and um, the salutes and sir. And he wants to use that force as his personal muscle. Um, we know this. This isn't hypothetical. And I think one of the things to point out about all of the articles in this special issue of The Atlantic is that these were carefully written and fact-checked articles based heavily upon what Trump's said and done already. Um, so the, the distance between his rhetoric and his actions when it comes to the military or anything else is getting um, really vanishingly small, considering that he has already tried to do a lot of the things that we talk about. He's already tried to use the U.S. military against its own citizens. He's talked about how um, he wishes um, that America's generals were as loyal to him as um, the, the Wehrmacht's officers were to Hitler. Um, he, he really got, isn't kidding. Um, as my David, my um, colleague David Graham points out, he's not bluffing. Um, and there are plans to uh, gut any of the civilian um, civil service um, guardrails that are inside the Defense Department and the Justice Department and the rest of the government. So in tandem, these are really dangerous things. And I think he's he's quite serious about not making the same mistake. Well, Tim, there's this question of what it means for jury selection, how it potentially complicates jury selection. There's also the question of what it means for Jack Smith, what it means for Jack Smith's staff. We have seen in the past when Donald Trump chooses to make a person his target, what ensues? Yeah. Yeah. You know, one thing that it helps with as a legal issue that the president is going to argue repeatedly that that a lot of these rules that apply to other criminal defendants don't apply to him. He's made that argument that the he's immune from prosecution because these acts occurred while he was president of the United States. The appeals court today as a threshold matter ruled he must be treated like any other criminal defendant. So there's a threshold victory here for Jack Smith, that the president has been treated as uh, any other criminal defendant. Now, admitting that there are some unique circumstances, he's a candidate, he has a First Amendment right to criticize matters of policy, um, but he's been held to the standard of a criminal defendant. That will be repeatedly cited in other contexts. Now, you're right, Alicia, when the president singles people out, anyone, 
it creates significant danger. Jack Smith and the others who are directly engaged uh, in this case um, uh, have to be protected. And I believe that they are. Right? Any, any person who uh, is engaged in a matter like this will enjoy the protection. But as Michael said, uh, criticizing Jack Smith is criticizing the process, and that will have ripple effects on others. It, it is an imperfect balance, yeah. but the court trying very much to protect participants but protect his free speech right. Imperfect indeed. I want to bring into the conversation former Deputy Assistant Attorney General and former U.S. Attorney Harry Lippman. Harry, Trump, he just posted on his social media account he will appeal, not surprising, of course, but then talk us through how that plays out. Well, the appeal, I mean, we're the D.C. Circuit here. The appeal is going to be in the form of an appeal to the Supreme Court. I don't see it going anywhere. And I think the most significant thing, first, I want to say Tim's point is really important. Thematically, uh, he was trying to say, A, I'm special, and B, this is a special First Amendment issue. They said, A, no, you're not, and B, you're just, it, this is a defendant issue, integrity of the trial issue. You know, Jack Smith and prosecutors are used to being under fire. That kind of goes with the territory. If it does actually begin to impute the process, Chutkin remains free to modify the order. And I think everything about the D.C. Circuit opinion today says they will be behind her. We thought they might have modified the legal standard, but they didn't. In terms of the court now, uh, unless they stay it while uh, he considers it, which he'll ask for, it, really, the game is basically uh, over. I don't see this as being, with so many things on the horizon, the attack that they will, I mean, the issue that they will uh, glom onto. If they did, yes, everything would be frozen and he could just continue to run his mouth. But but uh, he's effectively at the end of the road here, I think. OK, so, Basil, that is the actual courtroom in the court of public opinion. We know, based on experience, that Donald Trump will add this to his list of grievances right. and paint it as victimhood. Right. That's why, you know, when Michael was talking earlier, it made me think of, uh, of something I talk to my students about in, in many ways, that there are different types of power. There's this, there's this sort of direct hierarchical power where, if you think about the military, I tell you, do something, you go do it. But then there's the power of just my presence just me being uh, in the room or not in the room, that influence causes you to act because you want to support me. You, wanna, you want me to benefit from your action. That is an extraordinary amount of power that Donald Trump knows very well how to utilize. He doesn't it's have to be in the room. He's not civil fraud trial. That's right. He doesn't have to be in the room. He doesn't even have to say it through his lips. He just has to uh, be able to sort of send a signal, whether it's to Jack Smith in his um, attack on Jack Smith or just the fact that he has engaged Trumpism uh, in, the, in, in the way that has turned it into a cult, where the folks who support him will just act anyway. Yep. And that's what's so scary. Look, I, I think Tim's point earlier is correct in that this largely upholds Judge Chutkin's, um, uh, the, the basis of her decision. But to go to some of the comments that were made, let me go to the glasses for a second, torrent of threats and intimidation and a pattern of real-time, real-world consequences. So there is this awareness that he can cause damage and that he's a danger to others. But the reality is that trying to put a muzzle on him actually doesn't really do the job you think it's going to do. Because what he's already done and the way he's primed his supporters already means that you have to, you have to go after it further and further away from him. And that's, that's the struggle we have today. Look how much Trumpism is embedded in so much of our country right now. Watching those reading glasses mm -hmm. go on and off yeah, at this sure. table remind me so much of Nicole <laughs> Wallace. I miss her so much. Right. Tim, I, I want to talk to you about enforcement of this order, both in terms of sort of the, the legal document itself, the legal framework, and how easy or hard that is to enforce, given who it is we're talking about here. But also this point that Basil makes, which is a really smart one, which is, you know, Donald Trump, more than anyone, he knows how to use language and rhetoric, even if it was in within the confines he has been given, to signal to his supporters what it is he wants. Right. And he has a lot of surrogates. This applies to him because he's the criminal defendant. It does not apply to other people who speak on his behalf or who share his uh, political interest. Judges don't have a lot of remedies when it comes to enforcement of gag orders. They essentially can either fine 
a defendant unlikely to be uh, very compelling for a person of uh, the former president's means. They can order a person confined uh, for failure to comply. It, it, that would be a pretty high threshold. It essentially means the only way to guarantee that he adheres to this order is to is to incarcerate him. I think that would be take something really directly egregious. So it is very difficult for Judge Chutkin. As Harry said, she can reassess the order. She can call him back into court if there are alleged violations, have his lawyers answer for that and consider imposing further restrictions. But there just are not a lot of tools. The biggest tool and the one that I think I continue to say the most likely is it makes that March 4th trial date increasingly firm. Like the best mm. way to prevent really incendiary pretrial statements is to get the case resolved. So the more he talks, the more dug in, I think, Judge Chutkin and the process is on March 4th of next year. Remember the terms I've used, guys, vicious cycle. I've often used it with the political and the legal. I haven't really brought the money side into it, but it plays a part. Remember how I normally talk about it. Donald Trump's legal troubles are worse because he's politically weaker. As he becomes politically weaker, less and less Republicans, not none so far, unfortunately, but fewer are willing to stick their neck out for him. They may not come out against him, but they're just going to sit on the sidelines. And this this whole fear everyone had was, oh, you indict him, it's going to lead to riots in the street. Didn't happen because his movement isn't as strong as it was when he was president and shortly after he lost the election. So people are more confident in taking him down legally because he's weaker politically. But of course, because he's weaker legally, 91 indictments hurts you politically. It bold emboldens those people. But the money side comes into it as well. As the legal troubles add up and the political issues add up, you're less likely to get money. Donors, big donors and small donors are giving Trump less money than he used to have. And that leads to lower political support, which in turn leads to less money. His polling is collapsing. His billionaire donors are ditching him and the legal trouble, the bills and everything are adding up. He is toast.